Across the country, cold-blooded murders taking place, and the victims don't stand a chance. His tongue was out. He was foaming at the mouth. Heavy blood um, and constant. And the more we were wiping, the more that was coming down. The killers have a fearsome armory of ingredients at their disposal. Antifreeze is just like concentrated alcohol. So you're basically going to get them flat out, uh, comatose. It was like grey stuff. Apparently it was chicken with the strychnine in it. They had a good wallop of it and they were dead, basically. Pet poisoning, one of Britain's fastest growing crimes. From the winding paths of Northern England down to the suburbs of the Midlands and across to the streets of Northern Ireland, Britain's pets are under attack. Pet poisoning's up 60%. Experts are divided as to whether it's social angst, sublimated aggression, or a twist to nasty neighbour disputes, but all agree it's a growing problem. Hillelay, 30 miles southeast of Belfast. It's home to one of the country's most prolific cat poisoners. Over the past seven years in Castle Gardens, over 40 cats have been killed or gone missing. In the last year, number seven had four poisoned, number nine had one poisoned, and number 21 had three poisoned. Clearly, Castle Gardens is not a place for paws. Local resident Billy Walker is a cat lover, appalled at the killings. He's campaigning for the victims on the estate. So, Billy, this is Castle Gardens. It is. Well, over here, the middle house is one of the residents that is frightened to let their animal out at the minute because of the problem. So they've got cats there? With, yes, yeah. with cat poison that doesn't get out whatsoever. So it doesn't. It's quite a quiet street, isn't it? No cats about. It is, it is. And two, three years ago, you had to come down here. The place is absolutely haven with cats. So it was. Now, as you see, not one to be seen because people are frightened to let their animals out. Castle Gardens, the street of fear. You have a one there that had lost their animals over the years. At the end here, you have Gwen, who has lost over the last number of years, maybe 20 cats altogether, which is, uh, is ridiculous. See, very specific, isn't it? it? Is. It's just one street it is. that's being targeted. It, it, it is exactly one street. And if you go on down into Castle View, which is over that way, you have a number of residents along there too, whose cats has maybe ventured up to this part of the area and has taken the bait. That's the last Friendly. photo, Billy, we have a Blobby. Yes. Just a couple of weeks before he was killed. Yes, beautiful cat so he is, to think that anyone would poison him. Gwen and her daughters, Carlene and Laura, lost Blobby last year. We were going into Down Patrick and my partner, Martin, he phoned and he told me, he says, you better come out home. And I says, why? Because I thought he was joking. And he says to me, you better come out. He says, because Blobby's dead. And I says, that's not funny. I says, you better not be joking. He says, I wouldn't phone up and tell you. He says, you better turn the car and come back. So Laura turned the car. She was crying, I was crying, and Carly was crying, the three of us. Now, is that where you found Blobby down in the back this of the This is where we found Blobby, Jeremy, out the back. The backyard, all too often the final resting place of the poison pet. His tongue was out, he was foaming at the mouth, his eyes, the pupils in his eyes was dilated. He even got the police out and they had a look at him and they said, yes, he has, he has eaten something or somebody has poisoned him or something, so that's when we took him in. He wouldn't go any further than the garden or the house? No, no, no. no. he wouldn't go any further. He couldn't climb over the fence anyway, <laughs> he was too big. He was too big. Had you been he feeding him too much, was he? Yeah. Every time the, the fridge was open, he was in behind you. What had happened, I mean? Well, apparently there was fish fingers and other bits of food thrown in the gardens, dipped in antifreeze, and poor Blobby didn't stand a chance. So the fish fingers would have been sort of thrown into the front gardens? and Yes. And... Uh, the front or the back gardens, and then 
So say the animals, being animals, thought they had a feast in their hand and they eventually are poisoned. Fish fingers and antifreeze have become the Killy Lay Pet Poisoner's trademark MO, a classic psychopathic trait. Antifreeze basically is just like concentrated alcohol. So you're basically going to get them flat out, uh, comatose. Um, now, you can diagnose it with not specifically, but you can have a fair guess by doing blood tests and you, 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 the and liver enzymes will be elevated because of the damage to the liver. It's basically the same thing as, as alcoholic poisoning. Well, I thought it was only my cat was poisoned, but that night there was four or five other ones poisoned as well. Trevor was another victim of the fish finger killer in Castle Gardens. Cats like him have become a bit of a target around here, Well, they? I had one poisoned the exact same as him before. Used to sit on the fence there and the wee bird was in the yard and never touched them. Crikey, what did uh, he die? Um, how was it? Poisoned. Was it the same with the fish fingers as mm -hmm. the others? Yeah. My daughter got him lying over in the alleyway over there. And was he dead by the time he Uh-huh, yeah. My neighbours was lying below the... my son's cower. And it was poison too. Have there been any clues left at the scenes of the crimes? Well, the police will not say too much. They're just saying that their inquiries is ongoing at the minute, and that's understandable. They, if they have any evidence, they don't want it getting out into the public domain, maybe, because it could maybe prejudice a trial if it does come to court, which I hope it does come to court. With the killer still at large, there's a sense of menace in Castle Gardens and the residents can't afford to take any chances. The poisoner seems driven by an indiscriminate hatred of cats, a bloodlust to kill and kill again. Later, we return to Killy Lay as the hunt for the killer hots up. I know who's doing it, effectively, but we need the last piece of the jigsaw of the evidence to bring them to justice. Milthrop, a pretty village in Cumbria, not exactly the place you'd expect multiple dog murder. In the space of just 48 hours, a group of three houses all had their dogs poisoned. First, number one hillside had their dog poisoned. Next door then had two dogs poisoned. Finally, number three had three dogs poisoned. Claire and her son Connor lived in the middle of the terrace of murder. Two of their Jack Russells, Bella and Meg, were the first casualties. Bella was just laid on the in the kennel, and the tongue was out, and I just knew there was something wrong. So uh, Trevor had gone to work, so I just went and got him from work, brought him home. I went down to the pen, I went into the pen, uh, <clears throat> gave Bella a, sort of just a quick shake to see if she was... ..cos there was a little bit of blood, so like frothy blood around. Was she on the floor lying? Yeah, she was just on the floor. I mean, obviously, like, the rigor mortis had already set in. She was like a, a board. Uh, I shouted to Meg to come out of the bed, so she wouldn't come out, so I ran back up to the house, got the shed key, went into the shed, because the beds were built into the shed. Uh, had a look in the in the bed. Meg was just the same, just laid there stiff as a board. The natural feeling was that they'd been fighting, you know, because there's a little bit of throttery blood around, but, you know, when I got them out, there wasn't the marks. Or anything like that, and just from a you know previous experience, I suppose, of living in the country, I presumed that there had been some sort of poisoning. We knew there was something wrong then, seriously wrong, because you don't you don't just lose two pets. And then he rang the vet, and they weren't to talk to the vets, and then this is when it all everything kicked off, really. Claire and Trevor's next door neighbours, the Dobsons, were the next victims. The target was the collie dog, Merck. Christine, he's, he's looking a lot better than he did the day you found him. Oh, definitely, yes, yeah. <laughs> what happened that day? Um, well, I just popped down, because Mum and Dad were away on holiday, and uh, Claire next door said that, uh, you know, just check your dog, because you think that they thought that there's been poisoned, because one had just died. And so I came down, and he was just laying in the kennel. He was throttling at mouth, and, oh, you could tell he wasn't right, because usually, as soon as you come down, he's... He's bouncing about man. and yeah. yeah, jumping about outside kennel. So well, you had to pull him up. Mm, yeah, to carry him. And yeah, him I had to drag him up the path and uh, I put him in the car and took him straight up to the vets. Basically, the Dobsons took Merck for urgent treatment, and the vets started to notice a pattern emerging. 
I didn't click straight away no. that they were neighbours <laughs> because he was, with Merck being very much a farm dog, we thought, well, he's just come off the farm. And it was only when we realised that Mr. D no, Mr. Dobson actually lives next door now. And, uh, and then we started just to get a little bit, little bit anxious of what, what was going on. Back up at Hillside, two hours later, Violet at number three was next on the poisoner's list. That's Bonnie, Bonnie number one, as I call her. And that's Heidi. That's Gypsy and Trixie. Violet had four dogs and three would fall victim. I went down the lane. The dogs always run in front of me and took them down to the bottom, you know, the, the riverside, came back, washed my hands, and I felt something kicking back of my legs. Then I looked down and it was Bonnie. And uh, she was, you know, going like that. What, shaking? Yeah. Uh, of course, I panicked. I think I frightened poor Trevor. I rang him up, you know, to come round. I think I frightened life out of him. Anyway, Pete came back from work. That's your husband? Yeah, and uh, we took them to the vet. And as we got outside, Trevor said, oh, no. And I looked to where Trevor was looking, and a little gypsy was lying. So that and was another she, dog? Yeah, that was little Jip. So. I picked her up, Pete took Bonnie into the car and we went to the vet, but unfortunately, Bonnie died on the way. I arrived for work um, the next morning, uh, just before nine, and uh, Mr and Mrs Foster were standing on the doorstep and they'd got one um, dog that was obviously dead in their arms and another one that was gasping for breath. So um, I asked them to come in the consulting room and uh, I put the one that was gasping on some oxygen and um, she didn't settle down at all, she just gasped a bit more. And then within about a few minutes, she started having really severe convulsions. Did you have any idea that they'd been poisoned at that point? No. No, I did not, no. No, it was a dreadful day. The vets revived Violet's dog, Gypsy, but there was just one day's respite before another fell victim. Later on that night, I was sat in my chair, and Heidi was here, and she kept going like that. You know, on me, and I said, Heidi. And someone seems to say, touch her. And I touched her, and she was going stiff while I screamed. In two days, three households had six dogs poisoned and four die. Milthrop was in turmoil. I was concerned about other people's dogs, so I put notices in my garden, you know, overlooking the lane to tell people to be wary and don't let your dog suffer the same fate as mine had and Trevor's, and Dobson's. Who's on that one? Me, Pincher, Bella, Buster, Meg. Murphy gone. Heaven. Couldn't let Connor out to play. That must have been the most worrying thing It was horrendous thing because he was three years old. It was April. All he wanted to do was play out, and I couldn't let him out. How do you explain that to a three-year-old? The dogs had died a nasty death, but it wasn't clear what had poisoned them. Right, come on, walkies! <laughs> Until Violet made a chance discovery with her friend, Olive. Oh, dear, dear. Right then, hang on, tricks. Me and Olive had been for a walk. We were coming back up the lane and I said to Olive, oh, I'll show you where Heidi picked something up. And I said, here. And I said, what's this? Violet was in for a shock. She put her head here somewhere, and yes. that is where we saw it on that Monday. Monday, yes, more on the Monday. And I said to you, that's where she picked it up at, and then I said, oh, what's that? What did you see that, you, 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 that caught your eye in the hedge? Well, it was like grey stuff. Apparently it was chicken with the strychnine in it. What, rolled up into a ball yeah. of some sort? Well, just, you know, sprinkled around like that. Horrible kind of dog-sized morsel. Yeah, you know what dogs are like. If they smell chicken, they'll eat it, won't they? Violet had found some, uh, found some meat, um, which she brought in, and we had that analysed, and that did actually show that there was, there was strychnine in it. But this, I think she'd found that more by the... It was up the, by the path, ..by the little really alleyway, in the more, in the lane down, rather than actually down by the river. And we had that analysed at um, the wildlife part uh, of DEFRA, and. Uh, that eventually came back with, with a strychnine 
and similarly the uh, stomach contents of the other dogs all had strychnine in. Strychnine, a sophisticated weapon in the pet poisoner's arsenal. It's a serious step up from antifreeze and a restricted poison which somehow the killer obtained. The lethal dose um, is, is very small. Dogs are very sensitive to strychnine and the, the lethal dose is a tiny amount. Um, and obviously the, the smaller the smaller they are, the, the potentially the uh, uh, the greater the problem. The vet said it was basically it was a it was a form. It was like it was nearly instantaneously death. You know, up to thirty seconds, and they had a good wallop of it, and they were dead basically. So it's been thrown over, and some was here. Mm. It could have been anybody's dogs that come down, but it just happened to be mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You didn't get any though, did you, Trixie? Eh? Nobody's dog should have got it. No, they shouldn't. No. We've got Maybe. a nutter somewhere. When you think of it like that, a child could have picked that up. Well, you Connor know, could Connor have. could have picked it up. The Milthrop murders have exacted a high emotional toll on the owners and had a corrosive effect on the community. It never leaves me. It's not a thing you can dismiss, really, because you think there's somebody around that wants rid of dogs. I mean, it, in my, in my own view, I, in my, I'm 99% sure that it was somebody local, and I have my suspicions even to this day who it was. Uh, I mean, I've obviously, I obviously got uh, told by the police not to take it into my own hands because they had a suspicion who it was. Uh, they had a search of the premises but could not prove... They didn't have sufficient evidence to prove that it was who they thought it was. And they basically said that they couldn't really take it any further under where the law works today. You try and forget, but you don't forget, and I never will forget. A lot of hatred towards this person, yeah. Um, but what do you do? I can't live the rest of life with a grudge, can I, really? With the suspect possibly still living in the neighbourhood, there's been an uneasy truce in Milthrop. The previous killing spree was preceded by a series of anonymous complaints about the area's dogs, and this year the complaints have started again. Small Heath in Birmingham, and a housing association block, scene of the attempted murder of a dog called Titus. <laughs> I actually got in from the rescue home. It was um, uh, under the arches in Birmingham, and I think I paid fifty pounds for him. Um, he was a cross uh, Staffordshire and Boxer, uh, sort of brindle colour. I think he was eight, ten weeks old or something like that when I got him. And, uh, he was the one that stood out. As Titus settled into the flat, Marcus began to receive a series of complaints from a neighbour upstairs, William Eacock. We started to get these letters from. The, the housing officer, the housing association who owned the property, um, about dog excrement in the garden and things like this, um, and, and, and the, the fact that it wasn't being cleared up and all that. And it, it, it was a strange sort of thing because it, it was being cleared up. Um, you know, at least once or twice a week, we would go out there with a spade that we kept by the back door and, and go and put it in the refuse bin and, and, and in the skip. Um, but these letters sort of beca became more and more frequent. It wasn't long before things got nasty and the battle with his upstairs neighbour turned dirty. I actually found dog excrement smeared all over the, the windows, of the French windows and the back windows of the flat. Um, and that was the initial sort of, you know, planting the seed and there was something quite seriously wrong here. Pretty unpleasant, um, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It didn't smell very nice either. Following the incidents with the dog turds, events took an even more sinister turn. Ty started to become quite ill. Um, gradually, over, over a process of months, he started being sick. We'd, we'd come back and there'd be a sort of black puddles of just liquid, basically, all over the carpets. Um, to become um, sort of incontinent, almost. Yeah, yeah, almost. Um, you know, and yes, it did get quite worrying. You know, it, it annoys me now thinking about it, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, I eventually got him down to the vets and he said, you know, we're going to have to keep him in. This is getting quite serious. Soon after Titus's mystery illness, Marcus made an astonishing discovery. 
I was actually um, standing by the French windows. I'd let him out, I shut the door, and then we had sort of this security light thing that came on um, on the back garden. And this light came on, Ty sort of ran slightly over to the right, um, where this, this sort of chap's window was. Of course, again, I didn't have any suspicion at all that it was this chap. Um, and suddenly he ran over to go and eat something off the grass. Um, I sort of, sort of stuck my head out the window, realised that something had been thrown down, and as I did stick my head out, this, this chap upstairs closed his window. I decided to go out and, and actually pick one of these things up. It, it appeared to be like a sort of congealed, half-eaten meat sort of patty type thing, um, a bit like an uncooked burger, it looked like. Um, and of course, I took that to the vets. What was the analysis of the beef patty? It came back that they had uh, obviously been homemade um, and they'd been laced with ibuprofen, which is lethal for, for dogs especially, um, battery acid and crushed glass. Crushed glass? Yeah, yeah. Which would have met, uh, obviously his internal sort of organs were lacerated. He, I believe he, he diagnosed him with a, an ulcer, a stomach ulcer in the end. At the time, I can remember having the sort of images in my head of, of this chap in his kitchen mixing this meat and this crushed glass and this, not, you know, just beyond me. I'm not a very violent person at all. Um, my flatmate, on the other hand, was quite violent and, and, and so much he, he would rather sort of deal with his fists and, and rather his brain. And I'm, I'm of the opposite. Um, and they did come many times, obviously out of anger and frustration on his part as well. Um, of going up to his door and kicking his door in and wanting to kill him, basically. And that's how bad it got. Titus survived his injuries, but the RSPCA brought a criminal case against Marcus's neighbour, William Eacock, for causing unnecessary suffering to the dog. We certainly celebrated when, he, um, when the sentence was passed. Uh, Rob actually, uh, Rob Hartley, the, the inspector, actually rang me up after the court case. I mean, he saw it right the way through and stood up as a witness and all these sorts of things. Um, and he rang me up and he said, uh, well done, he said, we've got him, um, which was great, yeah. What was the sentence? I believe he got 60 days. Um, I mean, it, from what I was told, again, through Rob, it, it, um, the district judge who, who actually passed sentence was so appalled by the case, I think he called him evil and twisted. William Eacock served his time in prison. But despite numerous requests, the convicted pet poisoner declined to take part in this programme. The glamorous dog show world with its prestige, bright lights and multicoloured rosettes. But even this gilded ring can be tarnished by the dark arts of the pet poisoner. and her daughter Nicola have been showing Salukis for years. Salukis are regal, princely dogs that come from the Middle East. These are the rosettes that um, all of my dogs have won over the past 20 years or so have been showing. Um, they all have their own cabinet, um, of which some of them are rather full. It's definitely a bug, and it's definitely once you start, you don't stop. Um, is it competitive? Is it quite a competitive world? I think so. Um, I mean, I go and my dogs go because we enjoy it. And sometimes you think, oh, that judge might like my dog. And you get there and find they don't. And it's fine because I still come home with the best dog as far as I'm concerned. But yes, it can be very competitive. The living room in Nicola's home is a shrine to her favourite show dog, Ishmael. This is my boy's corner, um, Ishmael's corner. Um, this is a figurine of him that I had done the colouring is just perfect, and that, that's, that's him. He's um, in full flight as well, isn't he? He certainly is, and... He's he... after the cat at the end there, by the way. <laughs> Ishmael was born in 98, and I actually chose him at, um, at five weeks of age, and he came home to me at nine weeks, and was probably spoilt from the minute he came home. Um, all the dogs that you have are all very special, but there's always the odd few that eat away at different parts of you. And Ishmael certainly ate away at you. Um, and he grew into um, a very strong, handsome dog. Nicola got another Saluki called Laser and took both him and Ishmael to a dog show in Birmingham. 
It's a show she'll never forget. Judging started, Laser was in the first puppy class, so, you know, he was prepared, taken into the ring. So off you went with Laser. Normal practice, if you've got two dogs and the other's left on the bench, been doing it for years, you know, you have more than one dog, you leave them on the bench and off you go, show your dog. Came back, put Laser back on his bench, didn't think anything of it, was getting Ishmael ready to go um, into his class. And he'd been a bit quiet, and then he started to shake a bit, and I thought, oh, something's not right. Um, I better withdraw him. When Nicola got Ishmael home from the dog show, his health started to deteriorate. I could hear this snorting and sniffing, and we were having our tea at the time, so I put that down, went to see him, and he was bleeding down one of his nostrils, and he just looked very sorry for himself. So I thought, OK. So I tried to get him into the dog basket, but he wasn't having it. He still kept wandering phoned my vet to see what it was um, and what we needed to do. And he said, well, it could be a burst blood vessel. Let's just hang on, see if it stops, um, and give me a ring back in like 10, 15 minutes. Well, within that 10, 15 minutes, the other nostril had started. Um, quite um, heavy blood um, and constant. Nicola took Ishmael to the vets. It became clear that he'd taken some form of rat poison. Three weeks after the dog show, Nicola received a call from another exhibitor who told her of a man acting suspiciously. Apparently, um, a scruffy-looking chap was seen um, with trousers and a jumper with a print on with slightly greasy hair, sitting on Ishmael's bench with his arm around him, sort of stroking his chin, and he'd got a plastic bag apparently near his mouth, saying something along the lines of, they're nice dogs, um, he deserves a titbit, or something along that line. And apparently the exhibitor had said, you know, you really shouldn't be feeding other people's dogs, and if it's nothing to do with you, you really shouldn't be there. And apparently he gave, like, a childish giggle and walked off. Um, and that was while I was in the ring, apparently, with my puppy. So somebody had been feeding him something? Yeah, while he was on the bench. To think that somebody had actually poisoned him... Deliberately there, did such an evil thing, it doesn't bear thinking about, it really doesn't. And I just hope that other people don't have to suffer as Nicola and I suffered, and we did. It's not clear whether the poisoner was part of a show-fixing conspiracy or driven by hostility towards dogs. They're actually the last two photos that were ever taken of him, so these are, are quite special. Um, was that before he was poisoned? No, it was after. Um, that was literally um, a couple of days before I lost him. Ishmael's poisoning and subsequent medication put such a strain on his nervous system that it became aggressive and impossible to handle. It was the hardest decision I've ever had to make. You know, when you have an older dog, um, yes, of course, you're sad, but you know what life they've had, and it's been fantastic, and you just let them go with dignity. And I knew, I was aware, that I couldn't let Ishmael continue as he was because he obviously wasn't happy. He should have been in his prime. Absolutely. It was the day before his fifth birthday as well. Um, so we had to make the decision to have him put to sleep. Laser is now left alone to carry the torch, and Nicola's unduly protective of him at shows. I'm very lucky in the fact that I either have a friend that brings her dog with me, and we sort of leave both our dogs with each other if we have to go to the loo or something. I also um, have a couple of other close friends. If I have to go somewhere and Laser can't go with me, he stays with them. She's preparing him for Crufts, but there's a rub. It's held in Birmingham, and this year he'll be competing in the same hall where Ishmael was poisoned. Nicola will be forced to face the demons of Ishmael's death at the show. Back in Killyleigh, over 40 cats have been killed in the last seven years. The killings have outraged the local community. The shockwaves spread far and wide. Resident Billy Walker has campaigned to get the story on the front pages of the local press. This is one of the press releases that I had released, and it says, kill a pet owner's dog by cat poisoner. You've got Gwendolyn and Carly. So you have with one of their cats, 
think one of the survivors. I think it is one of the survivors. Another press release, which is kill a warning as cats are poisoned. Another kill a cat is poisoned in Cumber Road Estate. And that was done by David Telford from the Down Recorder. Local community worker Billy Walker contacted us and uh, there was a lot of uh, anger and frustration among the local community and uh, the most worrying aspect of it was that uh, there was no reason for the attack and it was the, the sinister motives of the people who carried it out. Uh, the very fact that they laced uh, fish fingers with uh, antifreeze was particularly galling for the, the people in the area and uh, they were left with the question, why? In the community, suspicions are running high about who is responsible for the cat killings. It soured the local atmosphere and set neighbour against neighbour. I can't understand people like pigeon fanciers or people like that have obviously got, you know, cats are their number one enemy. I honestly think it's something to do with the pigeon people. I mean, as you know, I'm sure you've been up at it, where the pigeons are. They're sitting right on the top of the, the state. With the town's pigeon fancying community first in the firing line, was one of their number behind the killings. Trevor, spokesman for the area's 30 pigeon fanciers, makes an immediate and passionate denial. What did you think when you heard about the uh, cats that had gone well, missing? I thought it was disgusting. So that disgusting, because I love animals. And to do that, I thought it was terrible. And pigeon men don't know that, they can't, like, you know. But if I got one coming in here, I would chase it, you know, but that's all I would do to her. In the past, you would have had pigeon fanciers being blamed for this. I can honestly say that this has nothing to do with the pigeon fanciers in Kelly Lay. The pigeon fanciers have been ruled out of the equation, and it leaves you to ask, well, well who did do it? And that's the, the worrying aspect for the residents, and they, when was the next attack going to come? With the murderer still in their midst, Billy's keeping up the pressure, checking on the residents of Castle Gardens. Ah, Bill. Well, how are you keeping Trevor all right? Bad, not too bad. I see you have the big uh, lady with you there. Is there a sense of nobody being brought to justice, though? Is it? It's not clear who's been doing this, is it? Well, in my own mind, I have a good idea who is doing it. And what I would like to say to them is that if it doesn't stop, the next point of contact will be the police. I just need that one bit of evidence to get them convicted. And I hope that when they are caught, that the full force of the law will come down on them. I would suggest that no one actually drove to that area, said there's a row of houses, they've all got cats, let's do it. I think you, you would find whoever carried out the attack probably lives pretty close to the to the houses that, that, that were targeted. It is quite difficult for the owner knowing that the suspected poisoner probably lives within two doors of them or they're meeting them on the street every day and uh, they can't do anything about it. But whoever the killer is, the question why remains. Is it simply a hatred of cats or what criminal psychologists call displaced aggression directed at the owners? The police investigation into the crimes is still ongoing. In the meantime, the cat owners are left to pick up the pieces. What would you like to say to those people who've been doing it? Just give me half an hour with them. Give me half an hour with them. There'll be no more pet poisoning no. in Kitty Lay. There'll be no more pet poisoning. If in Northern Ireland the poisoner lurks invisible in the neighbourhood, in southern England, there's a case of pet poisoning where the culprit was even closer to home. Fluffy. No, not Fluffy. Linda Greaves has two collie dogs, Jack and Casey. Three months after moving into a new home, Linda discovered Jack starting to have trouble with his eyes. His eyes started to be really weepy, um, looking a bit sore. I thought eyes got something in them or, or something. So I left it for a couple of days. I think it might have happened like on a Friday or something, because it was over the weekend. I was like, see how they are Monday. And then if they're no better, I'll take them down to the vet. 
Jack um, had never had a problem with his eyes before that. No, no, never had a problem with his eyes at all. They were totally misted over um, and ulcerated. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, like an old dog that has cataracts. Quite glazed still, aren't they? You can yeah. see that. You can like see a... where he's there scarred. You can, you can tell that compared to a normal eye. The case is normal. The vet suspected foul play. The vet at the time told me that they thought it was some chemical that was going into his eyes. So the vet said to me, has any of the neighbours or anything got it in for us? I was like, no, I've only just moved in there, really. <laughs> it's only a little old lady that lived next door on one side, and the other side, was the house was empty. You know, it's Perlean. <laughs> Not long after discovering the problem with Jack's eyes, Linda started to notice a change in his behaviour. He got really, really lethargic. And I was like, well, there's something, something not right here. Went over and checked him out, and I noticed a great big lump on his, on his chest. It was like a big fluidy lump. You could see, looking through the, his white, you could see the bruising that was underneath the change the colour of his skin. It was big, big, it was like a big bubble that was like that size. What colour did it go? It was all purple and dark red underneath. That's the colour his skin was. The vet told Linda that Jack's mystery lump was a reaction to rat poison. What did you think then? I couldn't understand where it had, how he had got hold of rat poison. I mean... You didn't have a big rat problem or anything? No, no. I mean, we'd only just moved into the house. So, I, as far as I was concerned, there wasn't any rat poison about in the house or in the garden. Soon after the poisoning, Linda then found a knife wound on Jack's hind leg. He had to have seven staples in his leg, which is it's quite horrible to see, really. It must have been a big wound then. Yeah, because they don't, they don't, they can't numb it either. He said it would be, they'd have to put the, the injection right into the wound, which would be more painful to, so they just staple it all together. With Jack rapidly becoming the unluckiest dog in England, Linda's friends were getting suspicious. Maybe the culprit was nearer to home. There'd be people at work kind of jokingly saying, well, you know, who's got it in for you, or what does Ian think? They kind of hint that it could be Ian or something. Does he, is he jealous, or, you know, how does he get on with Jack? Ian was Linda's new boyfriend. They'd met through a dating agency and had a whirlwind romance and immediately moved in together. Jack was was fine with him, Casey was fine with him. Happy family? Yeah. At first, Linda refused to believe Ian might be behind Jack's injuries. I just brushed it all off. I was like, no, he wouldn't do anything, anything like that. I was probably being totally naive about it all, but I really thought... But you wouldn't think that somebody you live with would do that? No, not at all, didn't have a clue was Linda sharing her bed with Jack's tormentor. Suspicious of her fiancé Ian's behaviour towards her colleague Jack, Linda Greaves started to keep a close eye on the dog. The house wasn't somewhere that I could, like, hide anywhere to, to have a good lookout point as such, to see what was happening when I left the room. There wasn't a cupboard or anything you could creep into? No, no. So I'd, I'd go up the stairs and listen out, and then I'd hear Jack yell, or trying to get under the table. With Ian in the living room, Linda came downstairs to find Jack crouched under a table. You couldn't see anything. You'd, you'd walk into things. You'd totally, I was like, oh my God, what's happened to him now? And uh, I smelt this really strong smell coming from his eyes. What did it smell like? Some acetone-based substance or bleach. It been rubbed into his eyes? They'd been either squirted in, thrown in, something like that. With a variety of chemicals flushed into his eyes, a knife injury to his leg and a dose of rat poison down Jack's throat, Linda finally confronted Ian. 
I said, do you smell it? I said, what do you think it is? How could it have happened? He's like, I don't know. I said, well, you, you must know. You're the only person in the house apart from me. I said, you, you've got to know. And he was the one that said, what are, you, what are you trying to say? So I said, well, you know what I'm trying to say. And then he just went upstairs, got his stuff and went, went to his, his mother's, I presume. This was the man you were going to marry? Yeah, yeah. He was just becoming really, really possessive. I think he just wanted my attention just to be solely on him. And that was it. Linda brought a case against Ian in the civil courts, although she never saw him injure Jack directly. The judge found in her favour and ordered Ian to pay compensation. The judge awarded £4,059 in damages altogether. And then he just looked at Ian and said, how do you intend to pay? And he just shrugged his shoulders again. And that was it. He didn't... Did you never get the compensation? I never got... I never saw a penny. Ian had declared himself bankrupt. His current whereabouts are unknown. Linda Greaves and her dog Jack, both victims of a boyfriend's jealousy. <laughs> It's three years since the killings in Cumbria where six dogs were poisoned with chicken laced with strychnine. Merck, Bill Dobson's sheepdog, has recovered from his poisoning. Now it's back to work. To think that they'd been poisoned. Mm, yes, that's right. Like it could have damaged the liver or anything, couldn't it? Like. Has he recovered? Yes. Well, you can tell, can't you? Come by. Come by. Come by. It's a story with a happy ending, albeit with a dark shadow. Up at Hillside, there have been new complaints in the village about barking dogs, and similar warnings have preceded the previous dog murders. Not long ago, I had a visit from the environmental health man. Somebody complaining about barking dogs, and I think that's what the killing was all about, the dogs barking because Trevor's barked and mine barked a lot. Dogs bark, don't they? Well, this is the country, isn't it? They do bark. <laughs> my dogs think the lane's part of my garden, so anybody going down, <laughs> naturally, they bark, you know. Having lost two dogs previously, Violet's determined not to be cowered by the killer and has brought in reinforcements. I was so lost without my two, I got another two. I got Bonnie number two, and then I got uh, the Jack Russell, Snoopy, making it back to four. And Gypsy's had puppies. And Gypsy's had, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she has. You're going to be popular. Oh, yes, quite. Violet remains resolute. And hoping the maniac who did it keeps herself to herself. <laughs> Cruffs, the largest dog show on the planet. 24,000 dogs, the creme de la creme of the dog world, competing for prestige and the chance to be best in show. Nicola's arrived with her Saluki laser and is nervously waiting her turn. But it's also an emotional time. For Nicola, competing at the show is a chance to exercise the demons of the past. Having had her previous dog, Ishmael, poisoned at a show, Nicola's anxious the same thing doesn't happen to Laser. He's never too far away from me, and, I mean, I've never been one for leaving my dogs for long anyway, but now he doesn't even get left, to, you know, for a second. It's difficult coming particularly to here at Birmingham. Um, in fact, this very hall is the actual hall that it happened in with Ishmael. Um, so it's always a, you know, a tinge of, of apprehension and sadness. But then, when you've got a dog like Laser, you then concentrate on him and enjoying his day. You have to be very careful leaving him on the bench. And I never leave my dogs alone on the bench now anyway. It's, um, you just don't know who's around. Is there a rogue element in the dog show world? Um, it's one of those things that's absolutely impossible to prove either way, unfortunately. We, there, there was a, an incident last year at Crufts but it never became anything. Um, it was never checked up on, even though we offered to check up on it, but the owners weren't keen. So 
and, and that's the norm. So to actually find out whether something funny has been going on or not is almost impossible. And who's doing it if they are doing it? Do you think? Well, if they are doing it, then clearly it has to be other competitors because nobody else would have any interest in doing it. By the very nature of the fact that they are dog people, dog lovers, the chances of it happening are very, very remote. But I can't say it doesn't happen. At Crufts, Laser never leaves Nicola's side. She's competing for him and the memory of her lost dog, Ishmael. Good lad. Good lad. Laser gets third place in his class at Crufts. As a young dog, it's a promising start to his show career. Do you think uh, Ishmael would be proud? Oh, I'm sure he would be. I'm sure he would be. Yeah. He, I mean, he loved this little lad so much. Um, yeah. Perhaps he's shining down and just on us today. It's a dangerous life being a pet in the age of the poisoner. With a thousand poisonings a year, death stalks you, even in the arena of your triumph. Death can lurk in friendly and innocuous forms. The very lanes might be laced with strychnine. Fear can slice into the bosom of your family. So keep an eye on your pet tonight. <laughs>